we appreciate everybody taking the time to be a part of this program. We have put together a phenomenal panel for you to represent a variety of different uh, perspectives and expertise in injury management, injury prevention, injury treatment, uh, and all sorts of aspects that uh, involve injuries and preventing them in youth sports and in youth soccer specifically. So joining us today, first we have Holly Silvers Gurnelli. Holly is a board certified physical therapist specializing in sports orthopedic rehabilitation. She has a doctorate in applied physiology and biomechanics with a master's degree of physical therapy. She's a current member of United, United States Soccer Federation's medical team, the chair of MLS's MMARC Research Committee, and a member of the International Cartilage Research Society's Rehabilitation Committee. She's also the spokesperson for the American Physical Therapy Association's Task Force on ACL Prevention and the Director of Rehabilitation for MLS's LA Galaxy. Danielle Slayton is a retired American professional soccer player and is currently a soccer analyst for Fox Sports and the Big Ten Network. A member of the U.S. Women's National Team from 2000 to 2005, Slayton also played for the Carolina Courage and the Women's United Soccer Association and was named the League's Defender of the Year. Slayton is also a National Advisory Board member of the Positive Coaching Alliance, one of the Players First Partners. Dave Mishra is the founder of Sideline Sports Doc, providing injury recognition solutions for coaches, parents, and athletes. He's an orthopedic surgeon and team doctor at Stanford University, a former team doctor with Cal Berkeley and the Oakland Athletics baseball team. He's also been a member of the team physician pool for U.S. soccer since 2006. John Cohn has a, is the founder and CEO of Fit for 90, and has a PhD in kinesiology. The biggest strength is his depth and breadth of experience that allows him to integrate sports science in the practical world of coaching and soccer. In addition to his company Fit for 90, John is currently the lead sports science educator for the United States Soccer Federation and was formerly the director of sports science with the Portland Timbers and MLS and an assistant coach with Sporting Kansas City. Tyree Burks was a college football player at Winona State University. Following his collegiate career, he played professionally in Europe and in the Canadian Football League. But unfortunately, Tyree's career was plagued by injuries and came to an end at 24 years old due to injuries. Although they cut his career short, they also provided insight into the prob one of the problems that needs to be solved in youth sports regarding tracking injuries, preventing injuries, and communicating around injuries, which led him to create the company's Players Health Another, another player's first partnership. So that is a, a lot of uh, words to describe a lot of expertise from our panelists. So we have here a discussion that will start with some broad topics and then delve more specifically as we, as we get into it. And the panelists will go back and forth and share different perspectives on each of these questions. So with that, I'll move straight into the question. And the first question will go to you, Holly, uh, to start with, and that is what age group should we as coaches or as parents start thinking about and using injury prevention? That's an excellent question. And initially when we started doing all this research in like the late 90s, early 2000s, we were starting with like the high school age group, the 13, 14 year old. And we realized very shortly after beginning embarking on this that that was probably a little too late. Because biomechanically, when we look at these young kids developing throughout the sport, um, we noticed that there are real deficiencies that we can identify even as early as eight and nine years old. So the idea now is to implement these strategies, and we've made some modifications to the program, because obviously what's um, applicable to like a 14-year-old is not pertinent to a, an eight-year-old. So we've made some, modified some of the programs that we've developed, like the PEP program, and there's an, a kid's version for the FIFA 11 Plus program right now. And the, you can implement those as early as eight and nine. And the idea is to basically create this vaccination of sorts. If we can prevent some of these pro, some of these deficits from being entrenched from a motor learning perspective early on, that we can mitigate risk going forward. Would anyone like to comment on that? Eight, eight and nine years old is probably a lot earlier than most people are thinking currently and, and certainly is, is difficult in some ways uh, in recreational level programming, but anyone like to comment on how to do that or any other perspectives on that? 
I think it's a logical regression going in that early. I think what we're starting to see is that the earlier the athlete is, uh, I think the lack of resources around expertise around building a preventative program is, I think, is missing in that point. So the older the athlete gets, the more expertise, the more qualified the coach is. And that's where we really start to see a lot of these preventative programs coming in. But I think um, if having access to the resources and you can start that early, that'd be probably the most optimal time to start building muscle memory and a bunch of other things. I think it leads to an interesting discussion about our emphasis, you know, from a coaching and a coaching education perspective, because a lot of times we do talk about the importance of our best coaches being involved at the younger ages. But I think uh, you know, we have yet to really deliver on that. So I think there is a piece to this um, that, that really lends itself to a, a more holistic approach and the coaches being more educated um, in regards to, you know, player health and well-being and the things they do on the field, um, always uh, having an injury prevention piece to it. Um, so for me, I think it's more about defining injury prevention as the development of injury resistance because it's not a, it's a full-time thing. It's ingrained in everything we do as coaches. So I think increasing the awareness of, of all our coaches and the education of all our coaches to be more adept at, at stepping into this domain, the, the better off we'll be um, and the less talents we'll lose due to, due to injury. Now, Holly, I'll, I'll just follow up on that because I'm, I'm sure you're not picturing uh, eight and nine-year-olds going through elaborate movement mechanic training. Um, so do you have some thoughts on how that might be integrated into programs for kids that young who obviously need to be enjoying what they're doing and engaged in a way that this could be done uh, almost organically within within what happens in a training session? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the techniques are so completely different than, like I said earlier, you would you would implement in like an older age group. But most of it, it's very fun. A lot of it's tumbling, uh, learning how to fall appropriately. So there's a lot of uh, work just doing forward rolls and cartwheels and just like basic gymnastics, which um, unfortunately a lot of kids now because of the real pullback on some PE and through school systems, they don't get access to that as much any longer. So we have, I'm seeing this new phenomenon of very good athletes, but that are very myopic in nature. So uh, they'll be very good at one specific sport, but when I ask them to do something outside of that realm, um, from an agility perspective and a coordination perspective, they're really lacking. So some of it is absolutely fun is um, paramount. <laughs> it has to be fun in order to keep them engaged and, and compliant. And then certainly it has to be applicable for you know the coaches to continue to utilize it. Because I think one of our biggest uh, shortcomings, and this goes for prevention across the board, even at the professional level, um, our biggest obstacle is compliance. So if we, if we can kind of build uh, these relationships now with these younger players at these younger age groups, and that just becomes part of their repertoire going forward. I think it's a really great precedent to set, and we have a real easy or a kind of an open field. We have to keep it fun, keep it applicable, and keep the kids engaged. Thank you. Uh, second question here, and I think it builds on that a little bit, but uh, this question is for Dave. What's the one injury, in your opinion, where early recognition from the coach uh, will have a huge impact on the health of the player? You bet, Christian. First of all, thanks so much for allowing me to participate on the panel, and thank you to our audience for joining us on Facebook Live. It's uh, terrific to be here. So what I want to focus on for a second is on-field injury recognition. And so this means assessing an injury or performance issue that's occurring during practice sessions or games. The answer to your question, in my opinion, is overuse injuries. And the one overuse injury where a coach can have a huge impact is actually low back stress fractures. That might catch you as a little bit of a surprise. But let me explain. As a coach, you're going to typically be the first one to evaluate an injury, or you'll be the one to notice a change in the player's performance. And so it's really important, of course, to recognize some injuries like concussion. But in many ways, the coach can't really influence the player's recovery from some of those. So with concussion, for instance, very clear. Recognize possible concussion, remove the player, defer to a physician for return to play. But it's the gray areas where you as a coach can really have some discretion whether to allow continued play or maybe recommend that a professional have a look. And the one area that's incredibly common in young soccer players and really all young athletes is overuse injuries. It's, it's become an epidemic in some sports probably take more than the entire hour for us to fully discuss this, but 
I'm seeing this really on the rise in, in, in soccer, lacrosse, gymnastics, tennis, lifting sports, and its lower back stress fracture. And here's where the early recognition makes a massive difference. So if we catch this thing early on, maybe when there's just a muscle issue or something, it might be a couple of weeks off from play. But if a player keeps trying to push through this, those stresses get transferred to the bone, eventually the bone can crack, and that results in a stress fracture. And in our real world experience at Stanford, our average return to play after a spine stress fracture is around six months, and some never heal. So a couple of weeks, six months, possibly never heal. So what do you as a coach look for? Well, you, you want to first of all have a suspicion when you see a noticeable change in the player's movement on the field, their performance, loss of kicking power, accuracy, those kinds of things. Now that's a super broad list, I admit, but if you see something that's clearly out of the ordinary for your player that's going on over the course of a number of weeks, practice sessions, or games, it at least behooves you as a coach to have a conversation with the player and learn what that thing's about. It may be an overuse injury, it might be something else in their life, but the point being is that as a coach, you're in a very powerful position to influence in a positive way, and I think that's, that's the issue. It's overuse injuries, and in my opinion, it's a low back overuse injury. I would kind of just add along to that, Dave. You and I were, were talking before uh, we started about what kind of environment as a coach can we create so you are having the communications and the open channel and really like that culture of trust. So if an athlete does perhaps, you know, feel something in their low back or some other injury, how are you as a coach creating that environment so a athlete can come to you and mention it? So it's not only on the coach to be able to recognize those things, but are you demonstrating ways that you value your players, not just for their performance on the field, but in other ways? How are you building that culture of trust over time um, so they can come to you with their parents, and with the players alike. I think that has to go do with building that connection, learning about your players, learning about who they are as people, so you can understand the differences and the nuances within each player and really create that trust and that bond. It seems a little bit kind of high level and cultural, but I think that that's a huge piece when it comes to injury prevention long before we even get to the subject of injury in general. I hear, I hear all those answers, and there seems to be a commonality there of methodology, whether it's methodology from the coach and, and putting some injury uh, prevention programming into the session at the beginning, whether it's methodology of preventing having the exact same uh, training type of session or training load over and over, which leads a lot to injury, uh, overuse injuries, as you talked about, Dave, or whether it's uh, having a culture uh, that that is open and allows open communication with athletes. Do you guys have have thoughts on 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 uh, how you how you create that culture or where you can go in some areas for coaches or even parents at young ages to find some information on some of these on some of these things? Well, I can chime in a little bit of that. I mean, I think that for me, and I grew up a, a pretty competitive soccer player, um, and I, I think. As a, as a coach, really first understanding um, the, the climate that we're in and the climate of pressure that a lot of these young athletes are under to feel like they're going to be the next superstar or get that professional contract or try to get that college scholarship. I think the reality in the club soccer culture is that this is being talked about. And if you don't think it's being talked about by kids as young as 10 and 11 and 12, I think we need to be really, really um, aware and responsive and attuned to the reality of that. And there's this fear of, oh my gosh, what if I can't play in that one game where all of these college people are watching? And what if I miss once that I might lose my spot and I'll never get in again? And what if, what if, what if? So I think understanding that we're in that that culture and that environment is the first piece. Um, I think Positive Coaching Alliance has a lot of different resources online at their uh, development zone to give specific examples. Um, you can find different articles and such as related to the different, um, you know, whether you're a parent or you're a coach. But to me, that culture of uh, building trust is not something you get to do in a day. It's not something that happens overnight. But um, I think it really starts not only with the coaches, but the administrative level and what that culture is at a bigger level that trickles down and how it's demonstrated at a very, very nuanced level to each individual player. 
Yeah, and I can piggyback off that, Daniel, as well. I think I 100% agree with you that um, that the administration plays a huge role there. I think it should start there. I think when you see most organizations that have really good injury prevention programs or that are really looking at kind of overall compliance around how health and safety is kind of being viewed, it's starting because the administration, number one, is making resources available. Preseason education training and coach training is kind of required. They, you start see kind of methodologies around how organizations are now using compliance and infrastructure to, to kind of trickle down to the athlete. And if it doesn't start at the admin level, it, it'd be really hard for it to go from, uh, if it's not bought in from the admin, the coach and the athlete is gonna miss kind of the market. That's <laughs> I think the one piece we're missing that we haven't really hit on completely is the, obviously the role of the parents, the role of the parents in, in this entire process. Because obviously what we're trying to do is create a conversation between not just the player and the, and the, and the coach, but then also the parent needs to be in, in this conversation. You know, if I reflect back, you know, when I was a youth coach, it's some very interesting conversations where, you know, the, uh, the emphasis was always on the outcome of a college scholarship, for instance, as opposed to the experiences that the individual athlete was getting. Um, holistically speaking, from from being a part of a, a team environment and so forth. So I think it's really important that that we look at this, you know, comprehensively. You know, obviously the coach is our primary focal focal point. Um, and I think you know the way we typically talk about this when I'm you know, working, you know, either through you know, Fit for 90 or U.S. Soccer, is this is a big part of leading the leading the players and them understanding, you know, uh, what it's like to be be an athlete in the 22 hours when they're away from us off the field and so forth. So identifying as an athlete and how that layers into health and well-being. Um, from a holistic perspective, am, am I a good teammate as much as am I taking care of myself from a health perspective? So I think it's a, taking a step back and looking at, at the, all the players, so to speak, I think is an important layer. Great. Well, on that, I, I want to go to one of the topics that's most difficult probably in, in injury management, which is uh, the load on players uh, from, from games, either multiple games in a day which unfortunately still a lot of competitions uh, have, certainly in the younger age groups. Uh, and even at the highest levels, there's uh, usually two or three days in a row of competition uh, at big events. So John, uh, I'll start with you. As a coach, how do you manage, uh, manage players that are gonna play multiple games on a weekend in one form or another to reduce as much as possible the risk of injury? Well, we can. We have to first talk about what the build-in is uh, to those weekends. So, obviously, managing the load on the week to make sure that uh, you know, for instance, we aren't doing any fitness level loads that week, building into the, the week where we know the players are going to play multiple matches. So, in essence, the tapering uh, of the players into that weekend. Obviously, we need to look at our our roster and we need to effectively rotate the roster as much as possible. You know, while while we're driven to obviously be successful in terms of wanting to win and so forth, that should never be at the risk of the health and well-being of a player. Um, and so what we really have to do is look at how we can effectively manage the players, manage the roster, so that we're not getting this accumulation of minutes, accumulation of the game load over the course of the weekend, or we're minimizing it as much as is possible. So we're giving each individual player the greatest chance of not just success on the weekend, but then success over time. Obviously, when we come out of those, those weekends, the next piece is, of course, you know, allowing the players time to recover. So we obviously have a, a big stimulus on the weekend, Right? If we give them ample time to, to recover and in turn adapt from that uh, essential training load from the games, right, they, they will bounce back and come back and, uh, and be at a higher level of fitness than when we entered it. Now, the one piece that you know, I haven't talked about is what do we do on the weekend? How are we effectively kind of micromanaging that window of time beyond what they're doing outside of the game? So, for instance, you know, mobility work after the game, pool recovery I found to be very beneficial, nutrition, hydration, sleep. You know, all these things need to be addressed, um, and it goes back to you know, kind of the, the management of the player as a, as a human um, outside of what we do on the field. And so, you know, it really takes a comprehensive approach for us to essentially survive the, these weekends where we're just saturating the, uh, the, the system, so to, so to speak, with, uh, with the demands of the game. I think it's really important if we if we take a step back to our conversation just a minute ago and the the, the players and the their willingness their drive to succeed <clears throat> succeed excuse me if we think about for instance or especially at the college the pre college level where there, there's a lot of recruiting going on at these events I think we have to be especially aware of how driven the kids are in all of these games 
um, because I think if we look at the, the data coming out as weekends, you know, we can visually see the fatigue that's occurring in those later games, but there's still college coaches lining up on the side of the field, and that's pushing the kids well beyond um, because the motivation is so high. So we need to be aware of it as coaches. You know, ultimately, maybe we need to articulate to the college coaches, don't come to the last day of the tournament, right? Because it's an additional stressor on the kids. We know they're not performing to their their uh, their best potential. So there's a lot of different layers to this, and I think we always have to think holistically. And again, the psychology of the player. Um, you know, one of the best things is they'll put it all out there for us. You know, I think it's very rare that we don't have kids that work hard. So I think uh, there's a lot of things that go into successfully managing these windows and times that we know are too much. And hopefully, in the end, we can we can start to uh, move away from the current norm. Uh, to, 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 to increase the likelihood of success of each individual athlete. So, John, I just want to clarify. So for those that don't know, when you're talking about training load, you're talking about a measurement uh, in, in one way or another of how hard a game or a training session was. And, and, and I invite you or someone else to comment, one, on how you manage that in the days leading up to an event and, and maybe a little bit more specifics and tapering. And then also uh, I'll ask for a comment at the end of event, because I think there's a tendency sometimes to think that one day off is enough recovery. So if we play Saturday and Sunday, take Monday off, Tuesday, everybody can hit the ground running. And, and I know that physiologically doesn't make sense, but there's still a lot of perceptions out there that, that a day off uh, cures all ills. And, and maybe if you can talk, or, or you guys as a group can talk about managing the load a couple of days before an event and a couple of days after the event. So I think the simplest way to, to talk about the load is going to be the the most uh, the most universal measure of what, what, what's considered a global measure of physical stress, and that of course is just a simple what's called a session rating of perceived exertion, so a session RP. So the player is basically scaling from zero to ten how difficult was the session, and we basically take that number. Um, we multiply it by the duration, the amount of time we're on the field. So, for instance, you know, our benchmark, of course, being the game, most of the time the players are going to be a 9 or a 10, right, in that game, but you know, the 90 minutes, for instance. We're just starting with the benchmark. So 9 times 90 would give us 810. Obviously, the 10 times times 90 would give us 900. So typically a game is somewhere in that window. And obviously we have variability by position. It's going to vary, of course, if I didn't play the complete match. Um, hopefully your goalkeeper is never walking off and telling you it was that high or we're, we know we're in dire straits, right? But that's going to be the, the best measure and obviously one that we can wrap our heads around the easiest is coaches. So, for instance, starting with a, with a coach, if I ask you to, Christian, to walk out in the field, today needs to be an eight and you, and you need to train for 75 minutes. You can do that, right? So if we start from the game and kind of move backwards from there, right? So the games are a nine or a ten and it's 90 minutes. Well, on a fitness day in our, in our team environment, now we're, we're talking about hitting an eight or a nine and the, and the training session in turn being somewhere around a, you know, 75 to 95 minutes in, in duration, right? And then as we back off from that load, we're just moving down, right, in terms of the RP, the intensity measure, so the numerical zero to 10, and then also moving down slightly in terms of that duration of the session typically. And so what we end up with is, for instance, if we're going into a week and we know we have these two games, Normally, maybe we'd have a Wednesday training session that would be, you know, our target would be an eight or a nine for 90 minutes. Well, we don't want to do that this week because we know we're going to overload the players in the weekend. So let's back it off, and instead, let's have a target of a six or a seven, okay? Because now we know the physical load is less. It's going to take less time for the players to recover and then, in turn, adapt to that training stimulus. So they go into the weekend fresher. So that would be how we would essentially taper in in a, in a really rudimentary and simple way, just reducing that peak training session of the week, for instance. Now, if we think about it, one of the things we talk about, the, the adaptation time coming out of the game, you know, at the, at the, the adult level, so essentially 18 and above, is we can benchmark that at 96 hours, 96 hours before they're back to peak performance. So not just to recovery, but actually the time to actually adapt from that stimulus, because the game is still a stimulus. So if we take that and we say, okay, well, you know, 96 hours per se, even though it, it shifts a little bit to left, if you will, so make, it comes uh, to be a little bit shorter typically in the youth athlete. That being said, if the youth athlete's also growing, we have the additive stress of growth on top of the stress of that game, something we need to be aware of. But we end up with a little bit of a shift, and it's not great. So if we add on, say, 72 hours to 72 hours, you're still talking about, that, well, that's six days for the players to recover. So exactly what you just alluded to, well, we took Monday off, well, no, you played two games. You played on the Saturday. You played on the Sunday. 
we're looking at about five days of recovery time from that last game. So the whole week, the whole week, the demand needs to be very low, right? Not to be said that we don't, aren't teaching the players. We're not still developing the players. There aren't moments where they play fast and play the game pace, but we're limiting the amount of time they do do that. So the load doesn't get away from us. That game that week afterwards doesn't ever get above a five or a six at most. So I hope that helps clarify it. I know I've tried to uh, fit a lot into a rambling monologue here, so apologies for that. Well, and of course, go ahead, Holly. I, I, no, that's an excellent explanation, John. I think that um, maybe one other piece to the puzzle is like looking at this sort of moving denominator too, because one of the things we contend with from a physical therapy perspective, when we're seeing it on the post side, you know, when there's an overuse injury or un unfortunately like an acute ligament injury, um, I've, I've seen or recognized that a lot of players uh, where that one week, one week the adaptation might be made, but then there's this incremental rise for the next week if there wasn't a tournament. So I think Tim Gabbert has published a lot of great information on this, like looking at this five-week moving average where you're not doing 10% more or 10% less for that matter than what was done the week before, because then we're, we're kind of continuing um, from an agility perspective, from a training perspective, you're continuing on, but you're not pushing the envelope and, and crossing some of these players either over the threshold into an overuse phenomenon, or you were under training them, which sets them up for injury in a different capacity. Yeah, I and, and I would add, and maybe <clears throat> Danielle or Tyree, you have a comment on, this is speaking uh, in isolation in soccer, but if you have a, especially at a younger age group, you have a, a player who's playing a soccer uh, tournament on Saturday and a Sunday, and then has a basketball game on Monday and goes right back to soccer on Tuesday or whatever it may be. You have you have loads that just add and add and add and add. And without uh, that culture, I think that you mentioned Danielle, where, where there's some transparency and communication or a holistic approach to the athlete, regardless of sport, uh, Soccer alone is not going to, or managing the soccer demand alone is not is not enough. Yeah, I think you make a really good point, and I think John hit on it a little bit earlier around how that's really where the parent comes in, because uh, the coach may not know, the soccer coach may not know that this athlete also has two other sports slash games that they've played in, and three other practices they're in also. So I think just being transparent around where the parent knows. The exposure there, uh, the 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 exposure rates or time that they're exposing that athlete to, and how when that fatigue does spike, that's when their athletes at their highest potential chance of injury. So I think really just educating the parents on what the possible consequences are of all of these athlete of all of the games practices and such, but also just communicating them on how that there has to be a resting period uh, for their athlete to minimize the possible uh, the uh, the potential chance of an injury. And I, I would go along to add on this, and I certainly am not the ex expert. There's people in this group who can answer this better than I, but not just looking at rest in terms of one day or five days, but really seasonally and throughout the year, where can you really carve out that time? Because the reality of the situation is that soccer is becoming more and more a year round sport. I, when I was playing, we had like a month off at least, you know, and that's well into my high school years. So to me, where are you carving out that big chunk of rest time um, if it's even possible? So it's not just looking at it from a week to week basis, but a global seasonal perspective as well. Yeah, you hit, hit on another methodology issue there and, and tying it to parent education, because I, I do think there is unfortunately this thought that more and more and more is better. And at some level, taking the foot off the gas and allowing recovery allows not only for healthier players physically, but, but healthier players mentally. Um, and, and in the long term, I think that's, that's a parent education and, and coach methodology issue. Um, <clears throat> You know, I'll, I'll, I'll change, change gears here a little bit but, and, and, and go with Tyree first, but we, we've just talked about all, all these different issues um, that, regard, that, uh, that ultimately uh, revolve around uh, player, how, how much players are doing and what they're doing and, and when they're doing it. Um, so when we talk about injury prevention programs and, and how to integrate that into training sessions or integrate that into this busy schedule, um, how, how, do you, how do you encourage compliance in that regard, both from the players 
and from the coaches. Because on the coaching side, you have this feeling of everything, every minute of training, you want to be valuable. So you don't want to lose 30, 45 minutes of a training session doing something that is only focusing on one part of the game and at the detriment of development. But on the other side is if you don't take into account whether it's rest or some uh, injury prevention uh, within what you're doing, you're ultimately going to lose the same amount of time because it's going to be from, from during injury or, or during uh, rehab. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we started with culture and we talked about that, so I really want to hamper on that anymore. But I really think it comes to just understanding that the, the rest periods in which maybe when John was talking about when the coach should be kind of uh, you know, the, the game plan for that practice should be a five or a six for that day. Maybe instead of us actually, maybe we're doing a walkthrough. Maybe we're working through preventative um, knee injury preventive programs, or we're going through some, some other programming around how we're going to do some neck strengthening exercises. I think it's really just utilizing time in which we should be having downtime or when we're actually going through walkthroughs and then those days, those walkthrough days are also muscle memory for game planning, but also around preventative programming as well. And I think for the athlete, Holly hit on it in the beginning around making it fun, understanding that this is going to keep them on the, in the game longer, but understanding that this is a fun exercise that they could do to continue to keep them engaged, but also to, con to, to continue to protect their body. I think the compliance really comes down from the admin as well. And I think really having a workflow around what is required for coaches to do for pregame stretching, pregame agilities, these are some of the things that I'm starting to see a lot of our programs uh, starting to do is that coaches have to have these preventative programs built into their pregame stretches, built into their pregame programming or their pre-practice programming. And the admins are really starting to really look at what that looks like and how that how the coaches are implementing that as well. So it really comes from the admin on down. And I also believe injury surveillance is a huge part of that. When I think of injury preventative programs, I think a lot of organizations really don't have the data to understand where they should start. And I think really uh, injury surveillance, having an athletic trainer there on the sideline, maybe for practicing games are a huge component, but also having access to injury documentation when incidents do happen, how they happen, the mechanism, allows us as an organization to now better understand where we should focus our resources and efforts to minimize possible injuries for the following year. I think those are really kind of, uh, I think those, that's a pivotal point that I think most sports organizations are missing today. If I could just chime in a little bit, Tyree, excellent points. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think from, from an injury prevention perspective, when we were looking at the development of different programs, so I was, part of the development team that developed the PEP program, which was specific for ACL injury, namely for females, um, and then the 11 plus, which was a more global attempt to reduce all soccer related injury, um, which actually has been used for other sports successfully as well, such as basketball and fielding, all field and court based sports. Um, we developed them as warm-ups, dynamic warm-ups, for a couple of reasons. One, namely for compliance, um, because we realized that time is of the essence, and if we can capture these, this audience for about 15 to 20 minutes. And what we have found through our research is that um, coaches don't have very strong feelings on how the warm-up occurs, so that was sort of time that we thought we could allocate uh, well and use it wisely. And what was interesting as a sub finding that was um, a positive one for us is that what we we found is when we do a dynamic warm up that is uh, neuromuscularly based, so on good biomechanical technique, what we found is that um, the the because they're in a non fatigue state, it's in a warm up setting, is that the technique of the the completion is better, so that the motor learning is better. So for example, if you if you shift these programs <clears throat> to a to be completed in a post-training session uh, position or in a fatigue state, that the impact is far less, far less. We did a big study in looking at the 11 plus in men's NCAA Division I and Division II, and we found some really interesting findings that not only was it successful, we were able to reduce injuries by over 45%, but the day of utilization within the teams that were using the 11 plus, the the injury rates were even lower, which is really interesting when we think about what's happening to the brain, like 
from a cortical control perspective on that particular day. The other nice finding, and I think this resonates with respect to coaches, is that the performance was higher. So we had a Division II team that won the national championship. There were statistically more wins and fewer losses in the teams that were using the 11 plus. Now, I don't think we're creating better athletes per se or better soccer players, but I do think uh, to this panel's point earlier is that we are allowing players to be part of the roster much later in the season and into postseason play because they're just healthier and available for selection. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, obviously the injury prevention idea I alluded to earlier in terms of developing injury resistance, I think that's all our goals is to, to, to create the athlete that's never going to get injured. I think it's always a challenge to coaches' compliance. I mean, my experience has been one where if we go back to our conversation about managing the, the weekend and so forth, there's a holistic approach to the periodization. Um, the teams we work with now, I think it's it's well over 100 well over 100 seasons at the youth through the professional level. And I think the, the number of injuries now that we've had, the number of ACLs we've had, I think is at, at, at six or seven, um, including, uh, including college lacrosse teams as well as field hockey, t hockey teams as well, as well as our, our vast majority of teams which are in soccer. And so we're, we've gotten pretty consistent through managing, and it is a little bit of a, you know, we give the physical framework to the coach every day of the year um, in terms of what we do. but. You know, our success, you know, for instance, putting uh, teams in the NCAA finals. So, so most recently, you know, Duke uh, women and Wake Forest men have been our two top achievers. But consistently getting through those college seasons with zero soft tissue non-contact injuries has kind of been the uh, the benchmark for us. Um, and obviously that you know, every player available is, is leading to success. I'll, I'll always say we, we have no role in, your, in their winning because they're obviously good teams without us. Um, but having every player available will certainly take – take a little bit of, uh, of credit for. Um, and so I think it's important to consider it holistically. I think, Holly, you, you mentioned a, a little bit ago uh, Tim Gabbett's work, and that is essentially, you know, the underpinning of, of solid periodization, you know, is, is getting that acute to, cran uh, to chronic training load correct. You know, managing the players on a week-to-week, day-to-day basis is really a paramount concern. So I think a holistic approach and, and obviously um, getting the coach on board is, is key to all of this. I just want to say that, you know, uh, Holly, thank you for developing PEP and 11 plus and want to thank Bert Mandelbaum as well for involvement. For for those listening in, the numbers that Holly gave are truly astounding reductions, 45 percent. I mean, uh, one of the phrases that you used early on, Holly, was a vaccine. Uh, this is like a vaccine. You can't get those kinds of reductions in any other intervention that I've come across in, in sport. And so I, as an orthopedic surgeon, could not more strongly recommend that coaches utilize these incredibly valuable programs for your players. Thank you. So just to, just to clarify, what, what everybody seems to be emphasizing here is that <clears throat> failing to take account of whether it's training loads or failing to periodize properly or to have injury prevention programming, there's ultimately going to be a price paid in terms of missed time. And that's not just missed time in competition and, and the impact and results, but missed time in the player's developmental curve. Because um, if they're not training, they're, they're, they're having a hard time uh, improving. So whether you call it a vaccine to prevent injury or a developmental tool, by keeping players healthy on the field longer, you're allowing them to develop uh, better and longer in their careers. Um, and, and with that, I'll shift a little bit because there's injuries are a fact of, of sports, especially contact sports. And I think we'd re be remiss not to say that you can do everything right and still have injuries. Um, so from that perspective, um, Danielle, maybe you can add some thoughts on when you do have an injury and you do have a player who's going to miss time and some sometimes unfortunately substantial time what can you do to provide to keep that player engaged in the environment to keep that player feeling like they're still getting something out of out of the sport and out of the team even when maybe they can't step on the field and train or compete yeah, I mean, I, th I think too, I mean, if we're, we're even referencing, you know, some of the, the comments that John made before about being con uh, considerate of the load that you um, are putting your athletes through, there's still things that they can continue to learn and, and get better at in soccer if they're not at a level eight, if they're not at a level five. I mean, if they're literally at a level zero where there is nothing that they can do to step on the field and they're off to the side, I think 
things that you can do is getting them involved um, in being an assistant coach in some capacity of helping them take statistics for you um, on the sideline. I think that as much as you can continue to keep your athletes involved and at practice, occasionally so they can find ways to stay engaged in the game. Um, I remember as an athlete when I was injured, I had a coach who was telling me that my job was to coach my position, the person who was playing my position, um, to watch and evaluate and help provide uh, feedback to, to her. Um, but I think more than anything, I think my advice, just because every context is different, every level, every age group, boys and girls, is to just be really thoughtful and intentional and pay attention to those who are on the sideline with injury and finding specific roles that you can help them fill um, in that context. Because when you're off on the side, you're already dealing with the struggle of the physical struggle, the mental struggle, but being tied emotionally and socially to your teammates, I think can help in that positivity, can help in that recovery as well. Um, so just being really intentional about coaching those who are injured um, nearly as much as you're coaching those who are on the field. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I'm going to go to to a question from uh, from the audience, and that is a question with respect to single sport and multi sport athletes and injuries. And I think there's a lot of uh, confusion in this area. And that as much as uh, it's different sports that may help uh, with injuries, it's really more about different methodology uh, and different training patterns. In the sense that if you do the same thing every day, seven days a week, 300 days a year, you're going to get hurt with overuse at a minimum, probably more. But can you guys talk about whether whether it's really different sports that is uh, helpful in preventing injury or developing an athlete, or whether methodology within the same sport can do something similar? For example, if a kid only wants to play one sport in the right environment, can they develop athletically and, and safely uh, compared to a kid who's playing three or four sports? I was waiting for I Holly. Got to you. Holly, Dev, anybody, John? <laughs> so, uh, I'll, uh, I'll jump in. I'll jump in first, and then Holly, you guys, you and Dave obviously jump. Dave obviously jump in. But for me, I think if if we are going to have a a kid, which uh, it seems to be a cultural shift to towards sports specialization, which is obviously it's problematic from a physical perspective. We're always hitting the, the players in the same way, the same pination angle and muscles and so forth. There's a litany of problems with this. If they are gonna only stay in one sport, which if kids select to stay in one sport, we have to be more dynamic with our methodology so that we can in effect develop them as athletes. And so the more, for instance, you know, even if I go back to when I was in Portland, right? So MLS level, the more we did in soccer, the less the weight room looked like soccer. Right, because the players need, we needed him at different angles. It wasn't specific at all because if I hit him with specific work in the weight room, and this is a professional athlete, I'm accelerating overuse pattern. And that's exactly what we're doing at the youth level by it always being a single sport. So we have to challenge ourselves, challenge the coaches, challenge the administrators, challenge, challenge the clubs, figure out a way if we're going to have primarily single sport athletes, how we're going to develop this into our programming. Because if we don't, we're going to continue to lose more and more athletes. So that's kind of, you know, for me, an overview of, of, the, of the challenge and potential ideas for a solution. Yeah, John, I completely agree that there was some really good research that came out of the Netherlands a few years back looking at like the, the optimal age to select out, like what's the optimal age for sports select selection from a from a single sport perspective. And that age fettered out to be about 15.4. And um, we know as, you know, clinicians and, and people working in the field, it is happening a lot earlier than that right now. You know, I see nine and 10 year old kids that have selected out, you know, in terms of picking one sport to play. So I think, yeah, the challenge is on the administrations and the clubs in terms of, okay, how can we create a diverse um, exposure for these kids that have decided at a young age to, to select out one specific sport and how do we not just sort of treat them myopically um, with sort of this horse, horse blinder, like you're just going to play this sport and that's just the exposure because ultimately that will lead to overuse. And then even perhaps the psychological side of it, maybe Danielle can speak to, is the, the psychological burnout aspect. If you select out too early with single exposure, um, you know, does that, does that exceed past 16, 17, 18? Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I would speak anecdotally, but I would say in working in my, um, here at Santa Clara University and kind of another role that I have, um, is that the, the, the mental side, um, and like mental pathology and just general struggle, um, seems to be anecdotally, not research-based, seems to be more than than in years past. So um, again, to, to John's point and, and the cultural shift, I think the reality of the situation is we are continuing to catch up and learn how to best manage the fact that um, we've got athletes who are coming to us who might have only played soccer. Um, and I know as, as a multi-sport athlete, I did ballet, so definitely different kind, kind of load and muscle movement for there. I, I feel like, you know, that was a, a real asset for me um, doing that until I was 12 that I mean for me personally I think that that's a um, figuring out different ways to, to have those different movements I feel like served me well and when you look at some of the athletes who've gone on to be um, successful and had long careers I, to me I would say anecdotally that seems like a, a factor certainly. There, there's some evidence about sports specialization that seems to indicate that it's not just whether there's single sport or multi-sport participation, but the structure around those sports. In other words, you know, we have a lot of kids who are playing multiple competitive sports at the same time, which is a very, very different load psychologically and physically on them than kids who may be playing one competitive sport and then perhaps some other things recreationally or even in that old standard, which seems to be disappearing, PE at school. So it's a more nuanced, I think, approach. Most people seem to feel uh, that multi-sport specialization, I'm sorry, multi-sport participation in the younger age groups has a lot of benefits in terms of teaching proper movement skills involving different movement patterns. And then at some point, I think we've got to understand that the kids who really feel like they want to go on competitively will do single sport specialization. But it's just, um, it's, a, it's a very subtle and, and nuanced thing. And I just don't think we have enough data to recommend one way or another single sport specialization. I mean, 17, we have two 17 year old gold medal uh, snowboarders in the last 48 hours, and they didn't start uh, doing multi sports when they were four. They've been snowboarding forever now. Um, so this happens, and it's, it's something we're just going to have to deal with. Right, and I think sometimes we confuse like peak performance and like uh, you know the highest level of play at a sport with I've been playing this my whole life. And I think what we've seen is that some of the most successful athletes in all sports. Um, you know, probably didn't start playing sports till later. I think it's really around culture. And I think the coach plays a huge role because I think a lot of athletes and parents are disincentivized to have their kids play more than one sports because they're encouraged not to by their coach. My son plays competitive basketball. He does play all year round um, basketball and baseball. But uh, the coaches are really adamant about giving their opinion about him playing football or another sport because uh, because they see potential in them. And I think this is really a culture around that has to be a, uh, inclusive, inclusive uh, nature around all sports that uh, that we need to communicate with all coaches. Yeah, I think Dave, you hit on a key aspect in terms of we need a little bit more information on this. We need more research done in this area. I think it's definitely a gap in our current understanding. I think it's interesting that you brought up the snowboarding. I, I grew up in this basically snowboarding skiing culture. I grew up in Colorado and, and I, I would wonder if we talk to those kids, if it was truly always snowboarding, because obviously it's a seasonal based sport. So inherently you spent your, you spend your summers doing a lot of other stuff. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to, to talk to them how much mountain biking do they do um, and, and so forth. So I think it's, it, it is more than likely that culture, you know, having been in that culture, it's, it's a fun culture and you do a lot of stuff that's outside of your domain. So it'd be interesting to know more beyond, like obviously that's a winter specialization. What else do they do? Because I bet they do a lot of different things. Well, John, you don't look like the typical snowboarder uh, hairstyle right now. So uh, no, I think I've been I've changed out of that. Trying to make it more professional. More professional. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think I think to tie this topic back to some others, the answer there is no silver bullet in this because 
to go back to talking about load in multiple sports, if you have players doing multiple sports all the time, they're going to get hurt. And then if you go to the single, single sport focus and they do the same thing in the same trainings with the same load all the time, they're going to get hurt. Uh, and then you have the mental burnout that's probably tied to the, both ends of those as well. If they're doing sports seven days a week, four hours a day, they're probably going to burn out of sports generally. And if they never get a break because they're playing one sport all the time, they're going to get burned out in that. So I think it goes back to an education and a methodology uh, perspective in terms of coaches uh, and parents and being aware that there, there isn't a quick and easy simple answer, but there's a real need for, for um, active engagement and education from the parent and the coach in that individual athlete's desires and what that individual athlete's calendar looks like. Uh, do you guys do you agree with that? Anything to add to that comment? I guess I would I would just say that you know and and John hit on this at the beginning, but you know reminding ourselves that these are humans <laughs> and not just athletes and really taking that holistic approach at an individual level um, in every capacity mentally, socially, emotionally, physically, um, with injury when without injury is. It is huge. I think one other thing too, when we when we think about allowing a, a youth athlete to participate in other sports, is having an acceptance on the coach's behalf of okay, missing a practice is okay, and there won't be uh, negative ramifications for that if there's another sport being actively participated in that particular season. I see that quite a bit amongst our youth culture. It's like I can't miss this because I won't be included in X tournament or X, you know, the, the competitive game this coming weekend. So I think, um, you know, from an administrative perspective and part of like building a team, but also building an outlet where kids do have an opportunity without ne necessarily having a negative sequelae. I think this is a philosophy, Holly. I think that you just hit on it. Like it's a philosophy from the club that, that really needs to be uh, something that's, that's talked about more openly. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, we've touched on some very complicated questions. So I'm, I'm going to back up here now and, and make something really simple. Uh, because I think uh, I think you all will have some some strong opinions uh, on this. So if we start back to very basic recovery and preparation for performance, two of the most important factors are sleep and nutrition. So can you guys uh, give some specifics on number of hours of sleep? Uh, because I think we would all say whatever the number is, most athletes are not hitting it. Um, and some nutrition guidelines that are generally basic enough that people can know whether they're close to them or not, because those two things together are probably another vaccine on injuries. John Cohn, how about you on sleep? Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to do a quick search on the computer to find the document, but essentially there's a, there's a sleep recommendations uh, and it's age specific. Um, I was going to pull it up and, and, and share the link, but essentially, you know, uh, I can't remember the the, uh, the the governing body, the National Center for Sleep, or something like that. They, they have specific recommendations. Typically, we talk about it being greater than nine hours of sleep that we want to target for for our players. So a little bit more than what we what we normally talk about it being seven, eight hours. Um, and so obviously, kids need kids sleep at a different uh, different patterns. Circadian rhythm changes over time. So, for instance, we need to be aware that our adolescent athletes are going to typically go to bed later and need to sleep in. So that's just a normal cycle for them. It, it's it's the norm versus our our younger athletes are, are going to bed earlier and, and, and sleeping, you know, sleeping uh, differently, if you will, in terms of the hours of the day. So something we need to be aware of. Um, and so sleep is a, obviously a, a key driver in terms of growth hormone release, testosterone, and it, that in turn is driving our adaptations, driving not just our recovery but our adaptation to exercise. So really important that it's a, it's a key discuss, discussion point for our players. And then obviously it's something we need to educate ourselves more about so we, we know what the, the ideal pattern is for the specific ages um, relative to especially pubertal growth spurt. When we have players that are growing rapidly, that's especially when they need you know a larger volume of sleep and it's, it's well beyond the, the nine hours. It's more along the lines of 10 to 11 if I remember correctly. Dave, Holly? I, I would just follow up. 
John gave an excellent explanation, but I think sometimes when even just looking at the structure of when games are scheduled and trainings, um, just anecdotally, my, my sister has three children, all pretty highly competitive athletes, and my nephew, who is a, a sophomore in, in high school, had um, you know, trainings for basketball, this was over over the winter break that started at 7.30. <laughs> I just thought, you know, when we look at all of the, the evidence that supports, you know, these kids probably are optimally training at more like 10 or 11 a.m. If you have the opportunity, particularly when there's a, a sort of holiday break, that that might be, again, talking about from a philosophy, from a club, or, you know, for this particular situation, it was a school setting, but really taking into consideration, um, you know, the needs of these growing kids and where they are in their physiological development. And that's a, that's a very important aspect of uh, when, not only how much we train, but when we train. Great, well, I think we could probably talk about this topic for hours and hours and hours and, um, uh, Still, still be discovering new things to new things to learn and share. So uh, we're we're approaching an hour. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to each of you for for 30 seconds, and uh, I'll try and find some uh, Grammy music to start to play if you start going longer than 30 seconds. Uh, but 30 seconds on any closing thoughts that you that you have on this topic. Let's start with uh, we'll start the way we did the introduction. So Holly, go ahead first. So thanks again for the opportunity. I think forums like this are so well, you know, so, so important. Um, our biggest uh, perhaps conundrum as researchers and clinicians is dissemination. So outlets like this are fantastic. Um, I would just encourage coaches that may be listening right now that um, when we think of injury prevention efforts, it only takes about a 30 to 45 commitment a 30 to 45 minute commitment per week. Um, it's low hanging fruit. There's so much research to support the evidence now in terms of its efficacy. And um, it perhaps has positive outcomes from a performance perspective as well. So I would certainly say, please add it to your repertoire. Okay. I think I was next. Yeah, um, I don't have a ton to add. I, I'm really just happy to have participated. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, and my two cents to add is just kind of what we alluded to in the beginning and what this overall um, culture and environment is and this triad, if you will, between coach, player, and um, and parent that really is going to contribute to the positive well-being of the athlete. Dave? I'd like to really thank U.S. Club Soccer with your Players First program. I think that what you're doing is truly unique in the world of the landscape of U.S. youth sports. And I think for the participants on Facebook Live today, just the, the commitment that you've taken to, to listen in on this is only going to help make all of your players uh, better and healthier going forward. So thank you to all of you. John? Yeah, I mean, thanks, thanks uh, as always, Christian, for for hosting this. I, I hopefully, uh, we're able to get some uh, important information across to the coaches. I think the biggest take-home message is, you know, being great at at what we do as coaches isn't easy. So I think the biggest challenge is taking the information um, that hopefully we've provided to you, wanting to to spur you to find more, and then obviously putting it into action. You know, because doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, um, all the knowledge is is useless if you don't step out in the field and you don't implement it. And so that's a challenge, I think, a day to day for coaches is can we do a better job? Can we deliver on this? And Tyree? Yeah, and I just want to just kind of echo what everyone said. Honestly, I really appreciate the opportunity for me to be able to add uh, a little bit to the panel. And I really appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, you know, my passion is around um, athlete health and wellness. And I feel like anyone that uh, is specifically focusing on amateur sports, which is kind of really where I live, um, you're in it for the kid. And I think that's the reason why we're all here today. And uh, I'm just excited that uh, everyone is really looking at this opportunity, uh, looking at this and starting a dialogue. I think it's going to continue. And uh, as long as coaches kind of remember that, you know, we're in this for the kids, the, the scoreboards, the scholarships, all that stuff will come. Um, I, I really just think it's really around kind of what we look at this. And this has to be kind of the main focal point. Well, I think that's well said, Tyree. And, and, I, and I'll close close with that as well in, in that in, in youth development, it, it needs to be a holistic perspective, and certainly health and safety needs to be 
the first priority of anything else because de there is no development when there's there's injury or, or when there's harm being done. So it sort of reminds me of the medical creed of do no harm first. So thank you guys all for being a part of this. Uh, the players first platform at US Club Soccer, uh, uh, all of your programs are, are partners, all of your businesses and expertise are partners within that program and our health and safety uh, platform. And so for people looking for more information, uh, there will be more and more information added uh, to the U.S. Club website uh, on a weekly basis on this topic. And uh, all of the information about the companies that you guys have uh, and, the, and the resources and advice that you have put out uh, is available there as well. Uh, so we encourage people to take advantage of that. So thank you to everybody who participated and, and uh, spent, the, spent their afternoon with us. And we uh, will talk to you soon, hopefully, in another similar, similar topic like this. Thank you. Thank you.